Well, blessings, everyone, and welcome to Answers. Thank you so much for joining with me today. You know, last time we were together, we looked at an extended passage, did we not? I mean, it was a long passage. It was like 40 verses long. We rarely do that in one program. But it was so important to see what it was. So let me remind you what it was if you were with us before. And if you weren't, catch you up to speed a little bit, okay? What we're looking at for the last couple of weeks is sort of where my heart and mind are usually drawn this time of year. Uh, if you're watching this on the internet and you're not sure what time of year it is, it's right around the first week of July in the year 2014. And so within the United States, everybody's celebration, celebrating the 4th of July, Independence Day, a celebration, right? And that's okay, and that's fine. But we talked last time a little bit about how we get sort of distracted with that, okay? And really, uh, large portions of the body of Christ have gone from having a, 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 what we should have, which is a time of, of blessing the Most High God, giving thanks to the Most High God for the life He's given us and where He has placed us and for just the blessings that have just been poured out upon us, we've sort of crossed over into that, into really sort of a form of imperialistic patriotism, okay? Which is not a good thing, okay? That's about the best way I know how to describe it. And when you start talking that way, people get all freaked out. They want to paint you red. They want to paint you blue. They want to make you sound like you ride an elephant or you ride a donkey, if you know what I mean, all this kind of stuff. No, that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is if we're not careful, we start worshiping the blessings of God. The Lord has warned us about stuff, okay? And we're not to do that. We're not to worship the blessings of God. We're to worship the Most High God Himself. And so what we looked at last week was one of many, many examples we have in Scripture, but one place of, that is a great model for how we are to pray for a nation, how we're to pray for a people, how we're to pray and intercede. Um, if you remember, you remember which verses I told you to look at? Which chapters? Yeah, there you go. Ezra chapter 9, Nehemiah chapter 9, Daniel chapter 9. All three of those have marvelous prayers, wonderful prayers. Uh, each one of them lifting up prayers to the Most High God for particular situations. Daniel was doing it privately. Uh, in Nehemiah, as we saw last week, the Levites had gathered together. The people were together. They were fasting. They were in sackcloth. They thrown dirt upon themselves because of what was going on. And they were seeking God. And in Nehemiah, they literally recounted the history of Israel from creation through uh, Abraham, through the deliverance out of uh, Egypt, and to going into the promised land, how God had provided them everything, to how the people had demanded a king, and God granted kings, and how the kings were doing things, and how the people were walking in rebellion. Let me read the last part of Nehemiah chapter 9, and then we're going to go over to the Ezra passage for today, okay? But we sort of hurried through it last time, and I want you to really hear what's happening right here. This is Nehemiah chapter 9. Uh, I'm going to begin with verse 33, and it's the last seven verses or so. However, you were just in all that has come upon us. They're speaking to God and saying, God, because of all our sin and everything that you have done, that we have done, you were just in what you did. It was hard upon us, but you were just in it. Okay? For you have dealt faithfully, but we have acted wickedly. They're saying God was faithful, but we are wicked. Then they, they give examples of what we've done. Now, the reason I want us to hear this is I believe this is exactly where we are today. Okay? Now, Israel was a theocracy. God wanted them to be, wanted to be God over them. They actually rejected him and wanted a king. We as believers on this side of glory worship God, but a lot of us act like we want a king. And I, I get in some pretty heated uh, discussions with some people that just don't see this. I, I hear more praise and adoration given to man nowadays than I do to God from a lot of people. I really do. And it's not right. Now listen to what he says. They say this. Our kings, our leaders, our priests, and our fathers have not kept your law, nor have they paid attention to your commandments and your admonitions with which you have admonished them. Is that not today? They may say, oh, yeah, I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian. I believe, you know, yeah. yeah. But they don't keep the commandments. You can say everything you want to, but if you don't keep the truth of the Most High God, you're a liar. Listen to the next verse. But they, in their own kingdom, you hear that? But they, in their own kingdom, with your great goodness, which you gave them, with the broad and rich land which you set before them, did not serve you or turn from their evil deeds. We live in one of the greatest, most blessed lands upon the earth. 
not just because of the people there, not just because things have been done, but geographically, just with weather patterns. We're one of the most blessed areas in the world. That's the reason we have such huge harvest of food, for instance, okay? Because we're blessed. But guess what? We're just like this. We turn our backs. We, don't, we choose not to serve him. We don't choose to turn from our evil deeds. And he's talking about the leadership right here. And then because of what the leaders do, listen to this, because of what the leaders are doing, in verse 36 it says this, Behold, we are slaves today. And as to the land which you gave to our fathers to eat of his fruit and his bounty, behold, we're slaves in it. You've given this land for us to eat of the bounty, of it, and we're slaves within that land. Its abundant produce is for the kings whom you have set over us because of our sins. Because we have sinned, what had happened with Israel was because they had sinned and demanded to have a king, God set a king over them. He told them what would happen. He said, when the kings come, they're going to want this. And he told what percentage of things they're going to take. They're going to take your food. They're going to take your young guys and send them off to war. They're going to take your land. And they're going to take your horses. They're going to take, they're going to take, they're going to take. And when they get some, they're going to take more. God literally told them that. Is that not where we live today? It's the same type of thing. He says this, it's because of your sins that he set these kings over you. And the abundant produce of the land is now going to the kings. And they also rule over our bodies and over our cattle as they please. So we are in great distress. We have literally moved into that type of thing here within the last few years upon the land where we live. To where our bodies are literally being ruled over. The produce of the land is for the kings. You say, well, that's not true. They don't do that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they do. It's all uh, a major portion of it is hidden. A major portion is hidden. You know how many times a loaf of bread is taxed? You know, you buy a loaf of bread in the state where I am right now, they actually tax your food. How regressive is that, you know? They actually tax the food. And you think, well, it's taxed one time. No, a loaf of bread, to manufacture that loaf of bread, from the time you start the whole process with everything that has to be done to create a loaf of bread, is taxed more than 100 times. More than 100 times. The average tax rate of everything that we encounter day in and day out is more than 50%. So more than half the produce that man is working to, to gain is taken by the kings. Okay? And people say, oh, it's not taken by the kings, it's taken and given to other people. Yeah, 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 believe what you want to. Okay, It's taken by the kings. They're ruling over the bodies and ruling over the cattle as they please. Even that cattle has become even more. In just the last three or four years, the various rules and regulations that have been mandated, you can't even raise cattle on the farm in the way that you desire. Do you know that? It's not a real popular thing that people know a lot about, but it's amazing. And then it says this, so we are in great distress. The people were saying, Lord, we're in great, great distress because of this. And so we've come before you. We're in sackcloth. We're in ashes. And we're asking that you do something. At the end of this, they say, now because of all this, we're making an agreement in writing. They said, we have agreed. Our leaders have led in this. We agree with the leaders. We've written it down. And we've sealed the document with the names of our leaders and the Levites and the priests. In other words, they're signing it. It's like a declaration of independence. You know how they signed it at the bottom. That type of thing. We're signing this thing, Lord. We're serious about this. We ask that you forgive us. I think we need to do something like this as the people of the Most High God upon the land where we are right now. Not so much the gathering together and the signing of a document. There's a lot of things that are done like that. I've actually participated in some of those things, and some of them are good. Honestly, most of the time, they're just sort of a show. There's just something grievous about it. I think the heart is not really there. I think it's more, well, God, we're doing this because we need to do something. There needs to be a brokenness of heart. As a matter of fact, there needs to be what we saw at the beginning of this and what we're going to see right now at the beginning of Ezra. So let me take us to Ezra chapter 9 and read the first few verses of this, and then we'll take a break and come back and read the balance of it, okay? Uh, Ezra chapter 9, verse 1. Let me just read it and then I'll bring it all together. After these things had been done, same thing had happened in uh, Nehemiah 9, after these things had occurred, okay, the officials approached me and said, the people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the people of the lands with their abominations. Now, we saw in Nehemiah last week, the first part of chapter 9, that the people had come along and had separated themselves. It was because of the word that we see right here, the chronology of it, okay? They decided to separate themselves from the people of the land. What that means is that they were intermingling with the people of the land. They were intermarrying with the people of the land, with the pagans of the land. They were taking on the practices, the religious practices of the people of the land. 
They were taking on the business practices of the people of the land. The same thing has occurred today among the body of Christ. We take on the strategies and the practices of the people of the land. So much, hear me carefully here because I'm about to offend a bunch of folks, okay? So much of what we see within the church growth movement, so much of what we see, well, we got to do something to make, you know, get people to come to church, to, you know, to be sensitive to people, to do all this kind of stuff. So much of that are simply principles and business practices of the people of the land, not a leading of the spirit of the Most High God. They had done the same thing. So what's happened is, the officials came to Ezra and said, hey, you know, the people in the, the leadership and the religious leadership, they haven't separated themselves from the people of the land. Then he tells who the people of the land are, from the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Parasites, the Jebusites, the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Egyptians, and the Amorites. They had actually been victorious over several of these folks. They had been defeated them. But then, guess what they did? They started adapting and adopting their lives. And then he gets real particular about it, real specific about it. Listen to verse 2, chapter 9 of Ezra. For they, okay, he's about to tell us how it's occurring. For they have taken some of their daughters to be wives for them and for their sons. And so the holy race has mixed itself with the people of the lands. He's saying the people of the Lord are mixing themselves with the people of the world. He says you don't do that. Scripture tells us that over the New Testament. It says do not be unequally yoked. You've heard that phrase before. And, you know, we apply it to marriages, and that's absolutely true. Uh, for instance, I will not participate in a wedding with somebody who is a believer who's marrying somebody who's an unbeliever because the Scripture says not to do that. I will participate with two unbelievers. Because I'm going to talk to them. I'm going to say, hey, this is what God's wanting. This is what's going on. I've had that happen before. And they say, well, no, we don't want to hear anything about that. We, want to, we just want to be married. And we want you to be a part of it. I said, I will do that. And I will speak blessing over you. And, I will, and, and, you know, codify this in the eyes of God, shall we say. But you need to repent and confess and call upon the name and be saved. Okay? It's saying right here, you do not mix these together. And they were doing that. Let me finish this sentence right here. And then we'll take a break. For they have taken some of their daughters to be wise for themselves and for their sons, so that the holy race has mixed itself with the peoples of the land. And in this faithlessness, the hand of the officials and the chief men have been foremost. The leaders of the people were the ones leading forth in this, trying to intermingle the people of God with the people of the land. You know what? We're seeing the same exact thing happen now, but from a political sense. The same exact, and it's being done on purpose. If you don't know what I'm talking about, don't worry about it. But it really is just watch the news of the day. It's being done for political control, using and misusing poor people. Nothing new about it. Here, the chief leaders were the ones that were doing it. When we come back, we're going to see what Ezra's response was. Okay, He has a response to it, and then he prays, and we'll go through that. So stay with me. I'll be right back. Welcome back to Answers. I'm picking on poor Michael back here. You know, he, he, he's just, he's worn out. It's the end of the week, man. So Ezra chapter 9, you see what happens. There's tremendous sin because the people were intermingling. The holy race, as it's described here, that's an interesting phrase, with the world. Ezra hears this. Ezra chapter 9, verse 3, he says this. As soon as I heard this, I tore my garment and my cloak and pulled hair from my head and beard and sat appalled. He wasn't doing this for any show. He was doing this because of brokenness of heart. He literally tore his, his clothes, which was the sign of repentance, the sign of remorse, the sign of horror. Okay, He did that and then pulled hair out of his head and his beard, 
We consider that today to be sort of crazy. No, he's showing how appalled he was. And he finally says, and I just sat down, dumbfounded, appalled at what I heard. Verse 4, Then all who trembled at the words of the God of Israel, because of the faithlessness of the returned exiles. These are the ones that were returning from when they were exiled in the time of Daniel. Remember what I was talking about earlier about Daniel in chapter 9? Okay, same one thing. He said, these are people who trembled at the words of God. They trust the word of God, and they're scared about what God is saying right here. They gathered around me, gathered around Ezra, while I sat appalled until the evening sacrifice. So he hears what's going on. He just tears his clothes. He's appalled. He's pulling his hair out of his head. And then the people who trembled at the word of God, those are few and far between nowadays, even among believers. Because if we really trembled at the Word of God, we'd learn the Word of God. Okay? They gathered around him, and they sat with him until the evening sacrifice. And at the evening sacrifice, I rose from my fasting with my garment and my cloak torn and fell upon my knees and spread out my hands to the Lord my God, saying. So he gets up. He falls to his knees, and he's on his knees, not on his feet. And he raises his hands up to God with his torn cloak and torn garment, and he says this, this is the prayer. But you notice the cry of it. This isn't a, a little, oh, Lord, help us kind of prayer. This is just a heartbroken, closed, rented type of prayer. And he says this, oh, my God, I am ashamed and blush to lift my face to you, my God. Why? For our iniquities have risen higher than our heads, and our guilt has mounted up. To the heavens. Folks, this is where we are as a people and as a nation. We have let abject evil take over. I mean, evil take over the leadership, whether it be political leadership or religious leadership. You sit there and see what certain denominations have passed in recent weeks when you see people embracing overt sin, just overt sin in the name of love and the name of grace and mercy of God. No. We have done exactly this. Our iniquities have risen high. Verse 7, chapter 9 of Ezra. From the days of our fathers to this day, we have been in great guilt. And for our iniquities, we, our kings and our priests, have been given into the hand of the kings of the land, to the sword, to captivity, to plunder, and to utter shame as it is today. He says throughout our history, and he doesn't recount everything, but remember what Nehemiah had recounted? We saw that last week, chapter 9 of Nehemiah. He said the same thing has happened. Because of our iniquity, our kings and all of us, we've been handed over to this stuff, and it continues to this day. Verse 8, but now, are you ready for this? But now for a brief moment, favor has been shown by the Lord our God to give us a remnant and to give us a secure hold within his holy place. Uh, some translations say a peg within his holy place. Uh, uh, King James, I think, says a nail in the holy place. The idea being this, that within the holy place, there's a nail right there where you can hang up a, a cloak or a garment. Lord, we have been given for a brief moment a place to just sort of hang on the nail right here within the holy place. Not very secure, but we're here, okay? For a brief moment, there's a remnant that our God may brighten our eyes and grant us a little reviving in our slavery. See, this is the reason that Daniel prayed for the people when he saw that the time was coming near for them to return because he knew these exiles were not ready to return because they hadn't repented and confessed. They hadn't called upon the Lord God. A small portion of them returned and came back. They immediately got downtrodden and got beat down. And Nehemiah and Ezra were the ones that came along and lifted them up and brought forth the word. But they went immediately back into the sins of the world. And he's sitting there saying, Lord, you've given us an opportunity here. We're still enslaved to the things of the world because we don't choose to walk with you. Verse 9, for we are slaves. Yet our God has not forsaken us in our slavery, but has extended to us his steadfast love before the kings of Persia. Before the kings of Persia, God used them to send the exiles back to restore Jerusalem. The kings of Persia, you know what the kings of Persia is today? Iraq and Iran. Okay, particularly Iran and portions of what we call Iraq, that whole area. And you know the things that are happening right there. Since we were together last, literally the northern and the western boundaries of Iraq just don't exist anymore. The group referred to as ISIS or ISIL, okay? 
I says, uh, has taken over that whole thing. And when, when that group right there writes letters, you know who they're writing the letters to? They say, to the province of Nineveh. They call it by its correct biblical name. It's Nineveh. Well, you've seen Nineveh in the scripture. What he's saying right here, these kings of Persia, God has used them to grant favor for us to return and to manifest the steadfast love of God. But what have we done? We've rejected it. So let me read this again. For we are slaves, yet our God has not forsaken us in our slavery, but has extended us his steadfast love before the kings of Persia to grant us some reviving, to set up the house of our God, to repair his ruins, and to give us protection in Judea and Jerusalem. So what they're saying is we've come back, we built a wall, Nehemiah did that, led in that. Now we have built a portion of the temple. He said we've built some of the house of God to repair the ruins of that and to give us some protection in Judea and Jerusalem. He says we know this is God. We know that God has used the kings of Persia to do this and enable this. But what have we done? We have gone and intermingled with the world. Verse 10. And now, O our God, what shall we say after this? For we have forsaken your commandments, which you commanded by your servants, the prophets, saying this, The land that you are entering, to take possession of it, is a land impure with impurity of the people of the lands, with their abominations that have filled it from end to end with their uncleanness. So what he's saying is, He's going back and picking up what God had told the people in Deuteronomy when they entered the land. He's telling them, when you go into this land, this land is unclean. This is my land that I'm giving you, but the people there have made it unclean, so you need to deal with them in a particular kind of way. They only did it partially. And because they only did it partially, we are still dealing with problems in that area. Okay? He's saying this right here. God told us what to do. Their abominations have filled it from end to end with their uncleanness. Then verse 12. Therefore, do not give your daughters to their sons, neither take their daughters for your sons, and never seek their peace or prosperity, that you may be strong and eat the good of the land and leave it for an inheritance to your children forever. See, God had told them point blank when they entered in that land, don't marry them. Don't intermarry with them. Don't seek their peace and their prosperity. You know, I go, I was talking about being unequally yoked and using it from a perspective of marriage. That's true. I think it also applies even to things such as businesses. If you have business partners and you have a choice within this thing and you're going to start a business, you want to partner, you don't need to get somebody that's an unbeliever. That's unequally yoked. You say, well, I can make a lot of money with this guy. Well, it says right here, the example that God gave them was don't seek their prosperity. Don't seek their well-being because what's going to happen is that's going to bring you down. So he's quoting what God had said for them to do. Now, last few verses and we're done. Verse 13. And after all that has come upon us for our evil deeds and for our great guilt, seeing that you, our God, have punished us less than our iniquities deserve, and we and have given us such a remnant as this. Let me just stop in the middle of the sentence right here. He's saying, you know, after all that we've done, after all that, the great guilt, the evil deeds. And you know what? You didn't punish us really for the iniquities that we deserve. We've experienced the same thing. I remember a little, a little more than 20 years ago, we had some elections and everybody thought it was the end of the world because certain people were elected and all this kind of stuff. And we have borne quite a burden. Evil has increased because of what happened then. But I had a friend that was just really taking us for God and was really bemoaning and saying, God, what are we going to do? And he said, the Lord really just revealed this to me and said this to me. Yes, this is evil and this is not good, but it's better than what you deserve. It's better than what you deserve. And I'll tell you what's funny. More than 20 years later now, this one that we looked at in this whole cycle of elections and stuff that we thought were so evil, now we look upon that as being well, a, a pretty good standard of maybe goodness, though it isn't because things are so much more evil now that in comparison that looks pretty good. What he's saying right here, Lord, you haven't given us what we deserve. You've left a remnant. Pick it up in verse 14. Shall we break your commandments again and intermarry with the peoples who practice this abomination? He said, God, you've already judged us. You judged the northern kingdom a long time ago and hauled those ten tribes off. So they were hauled off and they didn't start coming back to within the last hundred years of our lives. Okay? Now, we were sent off to Babylon where there's seven years 
a small portion, a small remnant came back from Babylon. Now should we pick up and do the same sins again that you warned us against before, but we did? He said, we don't need to do this. He says, would you not be angry with us until you consumed us so that there would be no remnant nor any way to escape? Then the last verse, O oh Lord, the God of Israel, you are just, for we are left a remnant that has escaped as it is today. Behold, we are before you in our guilt, for none can stand before you because of this. See, I think this is a great model and a great example of how we are to really celebrate Independence Day. Think about that. Because sin is increasing upon the land. Scripture tells us in other portions that the days are coming when that which is good will be called evil. And that which is evil will be called good. We see that accelerating. Oh, man, it's accelerating. Uh, I've read several articles the last two or three days to where uh, uh, school groups and things like this are totally denied the ability to speak of Christian faith in any way, but are being pushed and being pressed and being told and being mandated and being demanded to exalt uh, 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 homosexual lifestyles, sodomite lifestyles, that that's being pushed. And this is true freedom, and this is true liberty, and this is true love. The scripture tells us that we will be held accountable. So what do we do? I think that we intercede, that we pray, that we call upon the name of the Lord in the way that we saw with Nehemiah last week, in the way that we've seen with Ezra this week, what you see with Daniel. If you have time, read all three of those chapter nines, okay? That we intercede in that way, we pray that way, and we truly remain, mean it. And then we do what God tells us to do. He tells us, you are in the world, but not of the world. Separate yourself from the world. Okay. Now, it doesn't mean that it has to do with this and that. So often we get religious about it. The people that are yelling and screaming the most sometimes about living holy lives are the ones that dress like the businessmen in the world. Okay, There's inconsistency. No, I'm talking about this. Seeking first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Living a holy life and being the light that the Lord has designed us to be. Being the salt of the earth that the Lord has designed us to be. If we were to do that, who knows, as Joel says, who knows? Maybe the Lord will relent the judgment that is coming upon, upon those who are unbelievers. Hey, I thank you so much for being with me this time. Do celebrate in the right way. Intercede. When you're having a barbecue, whatever, get the group together and pray and ask God to forgive us as a nation. Let's see what he does, okay? I'll see you again next time. Goodbye.